So last time I was up here, uh, I started by telling you guys a story about uh, July 3rd, 1999, and how important a date that was, how, how God put me in a place where I was walking into a room as my now wife was walking out of the room and she was crying, and I was so chivalrous as to, to go there to her and, and offer to comfort her, and ultimately, you know, that day ended up becoming the catalyst towards, you know, five kids and all kinds of weird stuff. So it's been, uh, but that was actually not the most important day for me that summer, uh, believe it or not. That was July 29th. 1999. Now, I don't have an encyclopedic memory of every day of my life, but this day really mattered. Uh, you see, earlier that summer, um, I, was, I traveled for the college, the Bible college there, and I was going to church camps, and, and I was uh, working as a recruiter for the school. Uh, but before that, we, that uh, summer, i really not sure what I was supposed to do with my life. Um, I knew that God had a plan for me, but I also knew that um, I knew my weaknesses. I thought maybe I should be a teacher, but I, I didn't really feel comfortable standing in front of people. Um, I knew that I really wasn't supposed to be in ministry because this scares the life out of me. Present tense. Standing up here right now scares the fire out of me. And it scared me to no end then. I was completely worried. And, and I had been asked one time to get up in front of some students and talk to them about Jesus. And I fell over my words. It was awful. It was a horrible, horrible experience. Um, and so I, I realized that was not what God wanted for me. So I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. Um, and I told God, I was praying, and I said, God, if, if, if I don't get a revelation from you on what I should do by the end of this summer, traveling for the school, I'm going to go ahead and join the Air Force. Um, I was going to join the Air Force and, and go and, and serve God that way. And I was excited about it. It was going to be a good thing. Um, and, and so I, I told God that, and I was comfortable with it, and I'd spent most of the summer still getting no clarity. Anytime we would go to a church camp, I just got to help people, but just no real clarity. July 29th. That morning, I got up, just like the other mornings. Um, I got up, and I went into the chow hall of Tanglewood Christian Camp in central Texas. And it was hot, and it was um, humid, and I walked into the, uh, to the chow hall there where they were having breakfast and sat down with a couple of the leaders, including the, the head of the camp. And he looked at me. It was the last night of camp, and he said, So, Jim tonight you're going to talk at the campfire. And I said, no, no, I'm not. And he said, no, you are. And I said, I don't do that. That's not what I do. I don't talk in front of people. The rest of the summer, all I had done was get up and play games with people. I can play games. I can do that all day long, but I don't talk in front of people. And he said, it doesn't matter. You're doing it tonight. And I told him, I, I can't. And he said, no, you're going to. I spent, I spent the entire afternoon nervous and, and worried and praying. And in my Bible, I'm standing there. Everybody else is having fun. And I like to have fun. And instead, I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm reading my Bible, just, just pacing, trying to figure it out. And I get up in front of these students, sweating, sweating from every orifice in my body. I was nervous, standing in front of this fire. And, and I'm sweating. And then I started to talk. And something amazing happened. As I started to share, um, I started to share about how I had lived my life, seeing how far away from God I could get and still be in. But I had come to understand in the last year, which was uh, last year and a half, which was 100% true, that the Christian life wasn't about seeing how far from God you could get, it was seeing how close to Him you could get and how much more of Him you could, you could get and how there is purpose there that is not on the other end. And as I started to talk, this is when the amazing thing happened. The words that started to come out of my mouth were no longer my words. The, the things that came out of my mouth were, were no longer things that I had been thinking about. The Holy Spirit came upon me in power and started to speak through me. Now that sounds crazy to those of you guys who don't know, but it was an amazing experience. You see, in that moment, what God did is he took this, this weird, weak vessel, this person who was completely scared and completely timid, and he started to speak through me to the point then, afterwards, I sat down knowing that this is what God had called me to do. God took my brokenness and he showed me, this is my plan for you. I've had probably 10 different experiences in my life where God supernaturally intervened and showed, this is what I want you to do, or supernaturally intervened through me and, and I saw people healed, or these different things that, that could not have been done outside of God. In every one of those experiences, I did not wake up that morning saying, today is going to be the day that God's going to do something great. Every one of those experiences, I woke up the morning thinking it was going to be just like every other day. So here's my question for you guys today. Did you wake up this morning expecting God to do something powerful when you came to church this morning? 
Or 10 minutes ago, were you fighting with your wife saying, man, I don't think we should have done this. It's too snowy outside. It's a little slick. Anyone? Right? How many of us honestly woke up this morning saying today is going to be the day? I didn't. But that doesn't mean that God didn't. This morning, we're going to talk about stuff. We don't expect God to have, expect to have an encounter with God, but that doesn't mean that God's not going to show up. And so this morning, I want to share with you guys something about pursuing God. This, this, this month, we're doing a series called We is Better Than Me, and it's talking about our values being more about other people than it is just simply about ourselves. And, and the value I'm going to talk about that our church values is the pursuit of God, uh, how God pursues us and we are called to pursue Him. And what I want to share with you guys today is that the pursuit of God is something that is not just about you. That it is about you doing this and you seeking God as God is seeking you. But ultimately, it's not just for your glorification, your edification. It's not for you to be better. It's so that God can use you for something great. We want to be a people that pursues God here at Valley View. But we don't want it to be just about us. And so my question is this. What if this place with these people is exactly where God wants you to encounter him? This morning, in, in this week, in this month, God is going to be challenging us to move forward. And so I want to ask you guys to dig into your Bibles. Um, I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 10. It's going to be our core passage. It's going to be on the screen. But I want to ask you guys to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33. Um, if you have the Pew Bible in front of you, it's page 73 is where we're going to be. So if you'll, as you're turning there, I want to share this passage with you guys in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 24. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from our evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of a hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, we can pursue God boldly. We can go into the throne room of God boldly because Jesus has destroyed the barrier. Our sin has been destroyed so that we can enter into the, uh, the presence of God boldly. But it doesn't say that it's singularly. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says there's, there's 10 versions of us and we and um, us together one another in that passage. We are called to pursue God together. The door has been opened. And so this morning, what I'm going to ask you guys to, to explore with me is what does that look like? What does it look like to honestly pursue God? As Brandon shared here a bit ago, what does it look like to honestly pursue God and want to know him more? And we're going to find that in Exodus chapter 33, verse 13 through 18, or 13 and 18. We're going to uh, the, this passage is a conversation between uh, Moses and God, and I want to look at the words of Moses that Moses says to God what, God, what Moses asks of God. And it says this, Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, this nation is your people. And then verse 18, it says, Moses said to him, Please, show me your glory. Moses says to God, I want to know your ways. I want to know your power. I want to know you. Please show me your glory, but not just me. Consider that this nation is your people. It's not just about me. It's about all of this, and this is what pursuit looks like. Pursuing God is, is saying to God, God, I want to know you more. I want to know more about you. I want to know more about who you are, God, and I want to know more about what it is that you do now, Moses is an interesting thing because Moses, this guy had seen God speaking to him through a burning bush that was not uh, disintegrating, disintegrated as it was burning. He, he woke up one morning, he was out being a shepherd on the mountain like he had every other day, and then God showed up and told him, I've got a plan for you to go and deliver two million people uh, to, to the land of Canaan, which became Israel. And then he said after that, he, he showed, um, God showed him ten plagues. Uh, 10 powerful miracles that affected the entire country of Egypt. And then God uh, showed him the parting of the Red Sea. So Moses got to, to see God working as they walked through the middle of an ocean, which is just an amazing thing. Think about that picture for a second. Water going up for hundreds of feet on both sides, and you're walking through the middle of it. How crazy would that be? Wouldn't it be wild? 
You're glad I'm not there because I probably would have walked over and gone pink and then pss or something. But how cool would that have been to see that? And so Moses saw this and he saw, saw those things. He went up on top of the mountain with God for 40 days. And then uh, he brought down 10 commandments and, and God called him to do all these things. He saw all of these things. And right now, after having seen all these things, Moses says to God, God, I want to know more about you. I want to know more about your glory. Why would he do that? I want to share something with you that is actually one of my biggest heart fears. It's been uh, from my, uh, my early life, and I'm slowly starting to understand how this works. You see, I see Moses calling out to God and wanting to know him more, but I sense within my own heart not always that same desire. Um, and a prime example of that is we skip to the end. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, people would talk, not in church, but they would talk about heaven. People who were outside of church, they would talk about heaven and they'd say, there's going to be great hunting and there's going to be great fishing there. There's going to be huge mountains there. And you're going to go hiking and it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome and, and all of these things. And there's going to be little people with wings and harps. I don't know. That's the weird part. But the rest of it sounded really awesome. But then I'd get into church and when the people, the preachers like me would stand up on stage and they talk, start talking about heaven, they started talking about how we're going to worship God every day, all day long for eternity. Now, what people outside of this church described sounded really awesome to me. But when people talked about just worshiping God all day, every day for eternity, it actually sounded boring. And it scared me. It did. I didn't sound, it did not sound like something I wanted to do. It did not sound exciting to me. In fact, it's the reason I think that many of us, when we talk about heaven, we talk more about being reunited with family than we talk about God. Right? Right? Because the idea of worshiping God every day for eternity does not sound exciting. That's an issue. Because I look at Moses, and Moses says, I want to know more. So I started wondering about that here. I started wondering about that a few years back, and I was trying to process what that looks like. How is it that, that these people who know, know God, they want more, but then for most of us, we look at that and we say, I, I know this is, sounds sacrilegious to say, but I don't know that I want that. And then I had a realization. When I met my wife, before we were married, we actually spent a year with me living in Oklahoma, Elk City, Oklahoma, and her living in Dallas. And we'd see each other once, twice a month, but the rest of the time, we, our time together was spent on the phone. Now, I lived in a little tiny house, and I had a cell phone that only worked inside one corner of the house if you stood on a chair, all right? For those of you guys who remember the early 2000s, that was life. And we had nights and weekends where you could talk for free, the rest of the time, you just didn't get, it was like 20 cents a minute to talk on the phone, right? So it sounds insane to those of you guys who were under 30, but that was life. And so at nine o'clock at night, our, our night would open up and I would call Bonnie on my phone and we would talk. And I would sit on the bed if it worked or I'd stand on the corner of the chair if it really wasn't working and I'd stand there and we would talk from nine o'clock to 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, sometimes two in the morning, which is just crazy. But it was so amazing. Everything about her was amazing to me. Everything about her was wonderful. Now, I love my wife. <laughs> but when we go out to dinner, right, we sit there and we talk a little bit, we share some stories, and then it's like, well, that was fun. You want to go home? Go hang out? <laughs> that sounds pretty great, right? Does that mean I don't care about my wife in the same way anymore? No, I, I still love my wife. In fact, I... I I care more about her today than I did then. But I know most of her stories. She sure knows all of mine because I talk a lot. <laughs> right? And, and there's not a lot that's new because we're living these things together. We're experiencing these things together. We're, we're going through these things together. And so it's just not the same. You know what I'm saying? What if when Moses talks about God, he is understanding God in the same way that I understood my wife for the first year or two years, where everything was fresh and new and powerful because I'd never experienced it before. But with God, that doesn't go away. You know why that doesn't go away? 
Astrophysics, the largest things in the universe is all stuff that he's created. Microbiology, the stuff that, that he, has, uh, he has strung together is stuff that we still don't understand, but when we do, it makes us more and more amazed. We start talking about string theory, right? And we start talking about the fact that things can be in two places at one time. I don't know how that works. Some of you might know how that works. I don't understand it, but God made it. So a million years with God Bowing at his throne will be a million years of learning new things all the time. That amazement you had with your spouse for a year will be a million years with God. And so when Moses says, I want you, God, he understands that because he sees that he can never get enough because there's always more to know. There's always more to know with God. And so he is drawn to pursuing God. He cannot get enough because there's never enough. That passion in us for something more, that, that, that burning for something more when the stuff of this world starts to get boring or our spouse gets boring or our sport team gets boring or our car gets boring. We want something new. We want something different. That can't be fulfilled here, but it is fulfilled in God because there is never enough of him. And so when we talk about this, why can Moses say, I want to know you more. Please, God, show me more of you. Show me your glory. It's because he knows that there is never going to be a point where that's boring. And if we find God boring, it's not God's fault. God is not boring and his word should never be boring because he is powerful. So as Moses starts to do this and as he calls out to God, it, realized, it, ca it caused me to realize that I am not seeing God in the same way that Moses was all the time. Moses wasn't satisfied with the relationship that he or his people had with God. And so he said, I want that in my life and I want that for my people. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that on our end? If God is going to show him uh, his glory, how do we do that on our end? What does that look like for us? Well, I'm going to ask you to skip forward here. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to see a man who is pursuing God and pursuing God's work for his life. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14 is where we're going to sit. Um, so if you guys will turn there. It's not going to be on the screen. Um, but I've got it right here to read to you, and uh, it goes like this. It says, Not that I have already attained it, attained this, or have been made perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying this, I have not been made perfect. I don't have perfection in my flesh. I am not in a perfect relationship with God. I am not perfect yet. I have not attained everything yet, but I'll tell you what I have done. I am pursuing it. I'm running for it. I'm forgetting everything that's behind and I'm pressing on towards what is ahead, towards what is the glory in Christ Jesus. I only want that. Why would Paul say that? Why is he saying that? This is where it gets to community. This is where we is better than me. Paul is telling this to the church in, in Philippi because he wants them to know that this is possible. He's doing this not for him. He could do it for himself and not say anything, but he's telling them that so that he can set the example for them to show the world that this is something that can happen, that pursuing God has value and that God does make it better the more that you pursue him. Paul is actively pursuing God in a life that God has called him to live. We're not meant to do that alone. We're not. We're not meant to do that alone. In fact, we're, we're meant to be the example to other people that God has not forgotten this world. You see, when we live this, it challenges other people to live it. And the best way that I can explain this to you is, is something that I think God has created us to do. Uh, every sin, every sin that we commit, I had a professor say this one time, it was really powerful for me. Every sin that we commit is actually something good that God has given us that we have twisted into selfishness, right? So lying, what's wrong with lying? It's a good gift that God has given us to be able to communicate. No other beings in the universe communicate quite the way that we do, right? God has given us the ability to communicate. What is lying, though? It is taking that good gift and it's turning it selfishly, so I lie to you so that I look better or you look worse. That's what lies are, right? Basically, I lie so I look better or so that somebody else looks worse. That's all lying is. It's God's good gift turned bad, right? What is stealing? Stealing is, 
is God's good gift of I'm going to provide what you need, and stealing is I'm tired of waiting to God to provide what I need. I'll take it for myself, right? I know God's good gift. I'm taking it for me instead, right? What is adultery? Adultery is God saying, I'm going to provide what you need in a, in a relationship uh, sexually so that there's, there's bonds there. It's going to be a wonderful thing where you're walking together and, and it's joyful. And adultery is, that, is saying, you know what, I hear what you're saying, God, but that's not providing what I need. I'm going to do this for myself instead. It's turning it selfishly. It twists it selfishly. Well, the last of the Ten Commandments is a weird one. It says, I'll do King James for you here, guys. It says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's horse or his wife or his... The, you know, the, it should not covet. What is coveting? What is that? Coveting is looking at somebody else's things and saying, they don't deserve that, I do. Right? It's that. It's, it's, I, I, it's me looking at Alex and saying, that guy's got cool hair. He's, he doesn't deserve that as much as I do. But I can't wear Alex's hair because my hair's not cool like yours. But it's looking at somebody else and saying, he doesn't deserve that because he does this, 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 and this. I deserve that instead. That's coveting. Well, what's the good thing there? What is the good thing? The good thing is that we are made as community to spur each other forward. I should be able to look at the faith that Candace exhibits and say, her example is an example for me to strive forward, right? God has made us to spur each other onward so that when we look at somebody in the right way, we don't look at them and say, well, that person's a loser. They don't deserve that. Instead, we look at that person and say, that person is blessed. I want what that person has in the same way. So when Paul says, I have not yet attained this, but I'm going to keep going to do this and I'm going to keep striving for this, he is telling the people that so that they will know, I haven't attained it either, but I want to do what Paul's doing. I'm going to fight for what it is that Paul is fighting for. And what I want to tell you guys today is that you and I can be like Moses. We can be like Paul. And we look at the world around us and we say, this world is broken and everything's falling apart and our government's falling apart and the people around us are falling apart and Albuquerque is going to hell in a handbasket. Everything is dying around us. What this world needs is people like you and people like me to say, God, I'm going to pursue you with everything that I have. Because something happens when we do that. If you think about it, most of you know one or two people in your life whose faith challenges you to be closer to God every time you're around that person. And they're not jerks. They're not the people who sit there and preach at you and yell at you. They're people who you see something different inside of them every time they're around. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's a joy there that doesn't make any sense. They're the people who, when you look at them, you say, I don't know why it is that you're happy because you shouldn't be, but you are. And they're the people who would just, for whatever reason, randomly just show up and they say, hey, can I pray for you today? And you're like, you know what? That was exactly what I needed to know. I don't know how it is that you did that, but you were right on time. You know what I'm talking about? Those people are the people that this town needs. And do you know where those people are right now? Right in this room. If we pursue God, as Moses did, if we say, God, I, I just want to know you more. I just want to know you more. And we live that. If we pursue God like Paul did and say, you know what? I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. But I'm going to forget the junk that I've done in the past. I'm not going to let my past experiences or my past bitternesses hold me back from God. When we do that, those people become you. See? Proved it. <laughs> let there be light. Those people become you. And when we go into our offices and in our schools and into our homes, we start to show that there's something different. And I'm not just saying this. I know that this is the truth. I, I can see it in my own home life. Um, my, uh, my mom divorced my dad when I was three years old, and, and she remarried again when I was six. Uh, we moved to Albuquerque here, and uh, she married a man who was not a Christian. Um, my stepdad is not, it was not a Christian. He, 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 grew up, uh, he grew up very bitter and angry. Um, and so our home growing up was a rough one. 
in the, when it came down to following Jesus. My mom made it a point to try and get us to church every Sunday, and every Sunday my stepdad would give her a hard time about leaving. He wa- it was a weekend. He wanted to hang out with his wife. And she dragged us off to church, and we'd come home, and I would not want to go to church because we'd stay at home. I could sit and watch football, or I could sit and watch NASCAR. We'd sit here. Why do I have to go to church and go do these things? And yet my mom kept doing it. She kept dragging us along. Back in the late 90s, uh, my mom and stepdad moved to Florida after we graduated high school, and my stepdad was still antagonistic about going to church and about hearing about Jesus. Uh, here, seven or eight years ago, I think it was, um, she was at work, working in a mall, and uh, her coworkers were giving her a really hard time. It was kind of a really bad deal all around. And uh, my stepdad turned to her, and he said, I don't understand you. These people are coming against you. They're, give, they're making life bad for you. Why is it that you're not just angry and retaliating against them? And it was in that moment that she was able to make clear everything that she'd been living. And she said, it's because of what God has done inside me. I don't have to have revenge. Something in that window started to click something inside of him. Today, my mom's health is bad. My stepdad's health is not great. Um, If she's feeling up to it there at church right now, he with her. If she's not feeling up to it, there's a pretty good chance he's there without her. She was the example of Paul and the example of Moses over 30 years to the life of my stepdad. And she simply just kept living it. She didn't yell at him. But she kept living it. She kept pursuing. And in that pursuit, when you start to pursue that way, you start to show the world something that the world doesn't see. You see, if she had retaliated like everybody else would have, everybody else would have responded the way that they always respond. If we retaliate and we, we lash out and we do exactly what our flesh tells us to do every time we do this instead of seeking God, We're going to get exactly what we've always gotten. But what if this room today, what if you in the seat, what if the person sitting in the seat that you're sitting in right now becomes one of those people who is simply that example of someone saying, God, I just want to know you more and I'm not going to quit. If that happens, this is what happens. My bottom line is this, and it's out of Hebrews 10, 24. It's the last verse. Spur each other on. It says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I want to propose this to you today, that when we seek God, when we seek God boldly, what it does is it stirs up something inside somebody, uh, inside the people around you to be different as well. That when we seek God, when we do that, the person right next to you in this seat is going to say, you know what, I want what that person has. When we do that, it starts to make a change. It starts to make a transition. It starts to make a transformation inside of us. When we do that, but it's not something that we just simply live it and we forget about the people and we hope they come along. It has to be something where we fight for others. I'll share this story with you guys as we close. Uh, Fifteen years ago or so, um, I was doing youth ministry and I took a group of middle school students to church camp up here at El Porvenir. We take our kids to El Porvenir up by Las Vegas, New Mexico. We're up in the mountains there. Now, the church camp is at about 7,500 feet, give or take. There's a mountain, Hermit's Peak, that's 10,200 feet, I think it is. And normally, every week at middle school camp, they'll offer for kids to go up to hike to the top of the mountain. And there'll be 20 or 30 kids that'll decide to go. Um, How that works when you hike the kids to the top of the mountain is there'll be five of them that just want to run the whole thing, right? And then there'll be 15 of them that are kind of in the middle and they're fighting for it, and then there are five or ten of them sitting in the back saying, what have I got myself into, right? And as adults, you're, you're pushing the ones in the back and you're holding the ones in the front back and you're just trying to we can do this, we can do it. You get up and back down two and a half, three hours. It's a fun hike. Four hours, good hike. This week of camp that I was at, they made the decision that every student was going to get to the top of that mountain. Now, you see, while those 20 or 30 kids go, normally there's another 100 of them back on the campus who are saying, I can't do that. But this week, they split the kids up into groups of 15. And my job and another sponsor's job was to get those kids to the top of the mountain. But they had to get there together. So we started. And immediately, you've got the ones in the front who are wanting to run. You've got the ones in the back who are wanting to walk. 
the ones who aren't wanting to go at all. But what we did is we go, went and we said, look, we're going to fight for each other. Got about halfway, and the ones in the back are wanting to quit. The ones in the front are getting frustrated. Got about three-fourths of the way, though, and something started to happen. When everybody started to suffer, the ones in the front started going to the ones in the back, and they said, you know what? We can do this. Let's take another 15 steps, and we're going to stop. And they went. And what normally had been a two-and-a-half-hour hike up to the top was pushing four. But when we got to the very top of the mountain, something amazing happened. The last half a mile of the hike is flat. It's a mesa on top of this mountain. And as we're walking, these kids who had been too slow saying, there's no way I'll ever make this hike. We're walking with the other ones who wanted to run. And they're all walking together. And they're laughing. Some of them are almost crying. And then you walk out to this opening. If you've been there, it's amazing. You walk out to this opening and there are no trees. And you see this cliff and it drops down 3,000 feet. Right down below you, right? I mean, it just it falls off. And the kids stand there together saying, we did this together. It's an amazing thing because they fought for each other. When we spur each other on towards faith and good works, when we choose not to say, I'm just going to run ahead and hope somebody else keeps up, when we choose to do what it is that Moses said, God, say, God, show me your glory, and then we say, I'm going to show God's glory to you as well, we're all going to get to some place that we would never enjoy much alone, as much alone. When we fight for each other and we spur each other on, God does something amazing. So who are you fighting with? Who are you walking toward God with in my next step? This morning, we're going to take communion. And I want to ask you to start this way. I want to ask you to walk toward God with your family members, with the people that are with you. Go with them. Talk with them. Pray with them. Don't be ashamed to pray. I get ashamed to pray sometimes in front of my own family because I'm afraid they know my heart. But don't be ashamed to pray. Don't be ashamed to come up here and pray with your family. Pray over them. If you see somebody up here alone, I shouldn't be saying this, but I will. If you see somebody up here alone, go and pray with that person. Don't walk this alone. Spur each other forward. We'll walk toward God together. And then let's see what God does. I want to pray with you, and then I want to see as God works us in community to bring him to him. Our Lord and our God, I thank you. I thank you for your truth and power. And I pray that we would give you glory, that we would not be ashamed of you, and that we would not be afraid to know you more. Lord, give us words to spur others on. Give us actions that challenge other people to know something different. Help us to be humble and to bring you joy. Let us commune with you now, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come forward now.